Good morning, everyone. Welcome back for the Sunday. Uh, Before we get started with the message, uh, we're just going to pray and we're going to offer it up to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, as a church, Lord. We come before you and, Lord, we just really seek your face for the message. Lord, I seek your heart this morning. I seek you, Holy Spirit, to fill us, Lord. Fill us with your word, your truth, your love, your compassion, your grace, your mercy. Holy Spirit, just fill us till our cup runneth over. Holy Spirit, fill me, Lord. Holy Spirit, through my weakness, let your strength be perfected, Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus Christ, we elevate your name. We lift it up in our hearts. Lord, that you may be glorified. Lord, I pray that anything that is coming against this word that you want us to hear is nullified, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you let this go out in power, Lord. You said in Acts, I give you power. Holy Spirit, flow through us, mighty like a rushing wind like a mighty river. Let our hearts hear your word, Lord. Let it be pierced with your words. Let it be power, Lord, from your heart. Lord, Father, let us come to a place where we are at the throne of the living God, at your feet, Lord. And Lord, we just marvel at everything you do for us, Lord, that we marvel at you, Lord. We glorify you, not man, Lord, not man's heart, your heart. Lord, let us hear out of the abundance of your heart. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, do a work, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Amen. So good morning, everybody. As I was seeking the word this week, the Lord gave me a verse, and it's probably one of the most well-known and uh, well-used verses in the Bible. It's Jeremiah 29, 11, where the Lord says, For I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts not of evil, but of good. Thoughts of a future and a hope. And I want to speak on that this morning, because what does it mean to have a future and a hope in God? How do we apply that in our lives? What does it mean to walk in that future and a hope? Because God has a plan that we do have a future and we do have a hope. So we have to walk into that. As Christians as well, the Lord has given us a blueprint and that's where I want to be reading from today. And from one of the most well-known scriptures in the Bible in Jeremiah 29, 11, I want to read from one of the most controversial scriptures in in the Bible. And that is John chapter 8. And the reason it's controversial is many New Testament scholars over the years have looked at this story, have looked at this this chapter and questioned its validity. But for me, for me, every word, every letter, every sentence, parable, story, every chapter... Every verse, 31,102 verses in here, every one of them is of God. From God, by God, return to God. This is, everything in here is perfect. And the reason I say that is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all scripture is inspired by God for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for all righteousness that good works may glorify God. And so I'm not going to be questioning the validity of that this morning. I'm going to be declaring it because it's God's word. And in my word, it says, an adulteress faces the light of the world. This is the heading in my word, in my New King James. It's an event between Jesus and a woman. An event between Jesus and someone who is called an adulteress. We don't know her name, just adulteress. We'll know when we get to heaven, but at the moment, we know her as the adulteress. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. 
And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Going back to the beginning of that, it's such a beautiful story. And there's so much in this story. But going back to the beginning, I just want to walk through the story and get to the end. The very beginning of this story, the very beginning of chapter 8, it says that Jesus had come down from the Mount of Olives and the following morning, as he so often did, would go into the temple. And he would go into the synagogues and he would preach. In Mark chapter 1, verse 38, he says... For this purpose I have come to preach the word, to teach, to teach and to preach. And he would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. That was some of the first words Jesus records. Repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he often did this in the temple. And so the scribes and the Pharisees would often test Christ. And we will see a couple of comparisons shortly. I want to compare it to Mark chapter 12 in a minute. But the Pharisees and the scribes devised a plan. That when Jesus came into the temple, into the very public forum, they would bring a woman caught caught in adultery. That they would bring her into a very public forum and their plan, which they had orchestrated or devised, that we don't know that, but everything points to this happening because they were testing him. They brought a woman to him in a very public forum to test him. And it says that this woman was caught in adultery. This is, what, this is exactly what they said. Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, back then, adultery, ever since um, the law was introduced, adultery was punishable by death. Exodus chapter 20 lists the Ten Commandments and it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's one of the Ten Commandments. That's how important or a grievous a sin as God sees it. It's grievous. God finds this a grievous sin. And it carried with it a, punish, a punishment of death. Amongst other things, you look in Leviticus 20, there is all the punishments of sin in there. We're focusing at the moment on adultery. And adultery is something that is, happens when a man and a woman are betrothed for marriage or, and then they get married and then one, the man or the woman goes and has an affair. They go off with somebody else. It's adultery. And this woman, they said, was caught in the very act. Now, in order to pass a punishment of stoning, the person in adultery had to be caught in the act. They couldn't, they didn't need to be seen walking out of a a hotel room or an inn or a bedroom or getting out of bed. It had to be more than that. The very act had to be witnessed. And not just by one person, by two, to be corroborated. Two people had to witness it. And then they had to bring it so the law could be enacted. So not many people were stoned to death for adultery back then because adultery is a very private or a secret sin. But these two men have obviously stood, two men have obviously stood in front of Christ and said, this is the woman caught in adultery. And the woman caught in adultery, to be stoned, had to to have two witnesses. 
and they had to say, this is the eyewitness testimony. This is our eyewitness account. And it had to match up and be perfect. Only then could a punishment, a capital punishment, death, sounds brutal, be passed. But they did this to test Christ. Because it's such a secret sin, it points to it being devised. Where's the man? Where is the man in this? Because stoning was a punishment normally given to women. But the man was punished as well, and the punishment was death. The woman would be stoned. They would take the woman to the steps of her father's house and stone her in front of her father. The man would have something wrapped around his neck, and two men would pull the cordage or the bandage around the man's neck and literally squeeze the life out of him. It sounds for us barbaric, but that was the law. It was punishable by death. But not many people were put to death for this sin because of its secret sin and because not many people, would not, you wouldn't have too many witnesses witnessing that in the act. It just wasn't common. So they brought her to Christ, to Jesus, to trap him, her and trap him. And the thing is, is the Pharisees and the scribes were acting foolishly. They professed to be wise, but they were fools because they had done this before to, to Jesus. But this was them going, we've devised this plan. We'll, how, he can't get out of this. How can he get out of this? And the reason they were testing Jesus was because of jealousy. The Pharisees and the scribes were jealous. If you remember when Christ was brought to Pilate before his crucifixion, it said they brought, they brought Christ to Pilate because of envy. Not only that, but you couldn't pass a death sentence on someone for religious matters. The Jews were banned from doing that under Roman law. They had to have a Roman do it. They had to have Pilate do their dirty work. And we'll see in a minute, this is where, where they were trying to trap Jesus said, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him or tempting him. That they might have something to accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now this is interesting here because it says that it really makes a point twice that Jesus stooped down to the ground. And the first reason we're getting this image is Jesus was identifying with the sinner. He was stooping down. This was grace, unmerited favour, God coming to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to die and rise again to take man's sin. So Jesus was stooping down and going, I identifying with you. Stooping down to say, and it's a, it's a form of compassion and love and grace and mercy. And so Christ stooped down and wrote something in the ground. Now there's been a lot of ideas and conjecture over what Jesus wrote in the, in the ground. And to be honest, we'll never know until we get to heaven. And then all will be revealed. But I believe we're not meant to know. Because we're just meant to know the outcome. Because what he wrote and his actions convicted those men. There's been some ideas that Jesus wrote the names of the accusers in the ground. Some people think that he, Jesus wrote the sins of the accusers. Some people think they, he wrote the names and the sins next to their names on the ground. Other people think that he wrote the Ten Commandments. Personally, I would have thought that he may have written something like the wages of sin is death. But this morning... I really pondered on this, why he wrote in the ground and what did he write? And instantly I got something dropped into my heart and it was Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read it, you don't have to turn with me. And a lot of people call this the forbidden chapter because the Jews that have rejected Christ don't like referring or reading this chapter because it's so accurately prophesies and points to Jesus being the Messiah and in verse 7 it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth 
He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He stooped down and wrote into the ground. He remained silent. I'm wondering whether he wrote this verse down, that he was pointing to him being the Messiah, that he would be oppressed for our sin, that he would be silent. That's why Jesus, I believe, didn't speak. And if you remember when he went to the cross, when he stood in front of his accusers, he remained silent. A fulfillment of this prophetic message, this, prof- this prophecy in Isaiah 53. And Isaiah would have been one of the most recognised red books um, in, in the synagogue at the time. We would, we would see that. And moving on. And that's the finger of God, by the way. We saw it in the Old Testament when God wrote on the wall, remember? This is Jesus writing, the finger of God. Beautiful picture. <clears throat> so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, as if, as if he had to, Jesus raised himself up to address them. This is Jesus going, you know, I'm speaking to you in authority now. That's, that's what I get out of this. He raised himself up and he says, he who is without sin among you, you know, you throw the, you throw the first stone, go on. Jesus, gentle, it says uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says that uh, Jesus is described as having meekness and patience and he's, he's quiet. And I, can, I just see Jesus' authority in that, in that meekness in that, uh, yeah, meekness. It's the best way to describe it. You know, but he, he carried authority. And this was Jesus standing in front of her accusers and his accusers and saying, I am the fulfillment of the law. You cast the first stone. Because if Jesus had, had, had agreed with them and said, yeah, let's stone the adulteress, let's stone her. One, He would have been seen as someone that wasn't compassionate, not loving, no mercy, no grace. And that was Jesus' ministry. He walked humbly as a man in grace and love and compassion. The compassion Christ showed people was unparalleled. You know, eating and drinking with tax collectors, healing lepers, going to the unclean, talking to adulteresses. This was not the done thing. But if Jesus had agreed and said, yeah, go on, stone her. She's, been, she's broken the law. She's broken Moses' commandment. Stone her. The Pharisees and the scribes would have thought their plan had worked. Jesus would have broken Roman law. And Rome said, like we see when Jesus was taken to Pilate, you can't execute someone for religious matters. Only Rome could do that. And if Jesus had said no... You're not stoning her. Jesus would have been seen to have been breaking Moses' law. And in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. So if Jesus said, No, you're not stoning her, he would have broken Moses' law. But he was fulfilling this because the punishment of death was right. The Pharisees and the scribes, even though they're corrupt hearts and they devised a plan to entrap Jesus and the adulteress, according to the law, they were correct. It carried a punishment of death. So Jesus said that to them, you know, who has no sin? Go on, cast the first stone. Jesus brought conviction. And we'll see in a minute, he doesn't condemn, he convicts. So when they had continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin, let him throw a stone at her first. And then again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground again. But those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, conviction, conviction had entered into their hearts. Christ convicted And you know, that word there in the Greek, the word for word, or when Jesus stooped down and wrote, sorry, wrote, the word for wrote 
is a Greek word called katagraphini. And it actually means to write down a record against somebody. So Jesus was writing something against, on the ground against the Pharisees and the scribes to prick their conscience, to convict them. So when those, they were convicted by their conscience and they went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And I find that interesting that the oldest started to leave first. And I, I, I don't know why that's the case. I've got a few ideas. But really, if the Lord's writing scripture from, say, Isaiah or wherever, so from the scriptures, he's writing it into the ground I would say the oldest, the most trained, the most versed Pharisees and scribes probably would have recognised at first. I don't know. Um, we'll know when we get to heaven. Jesus was left alone. So all of these people left. All of these accusers left. Except for Christ and the adulteress. That's a beautiful picture. Just Jesus with a woman caught in sin. Both of them accused Jesus raised himself up, saw no one but the woman. Women, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord, no one's condemned me. And this was humiliating for the woman. I, my heart really goes out to this woman. Just used as a pawn to test and tempt Jesus from the corrupt nature of a corrupt religious order that saw themselves as worthy and holy and didn't recognize Christ as the Messiah. Using a woman that Christ loved. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go, sin no more. That's the message I'm giving today. In Romans 8.1 it says, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So once she believed, condemnation passed over her. You see, no one called Jesus, the only person to call Jesus Lord in this whole event, this whole scenario, was her. She said, Lord, belief. And we know that belief is in the heart and is in the confession. Believe. Believe in me. Believe that I am the Lord. Believe that I am Christ. Believe that I am the Son of God. Believe that I am the Messiah. Believe in your heart. Confess it with your mouth that I died and I rose again. Lord. And Jesus didn't perform a miracle. He didn't give a great sermon. Jesus did very little. He actually didn't really even speak. Conviction into her heart. Believe, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I. But go and sin no more. Because this is the will of God for us. In 2 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For this is the will of God. Uh, sorry, for 1 Thessalonians 4.3. Sorry. For this is the will of God. Sanctification. It is God's will that we go away and sin no more. It is the will of God. So when we talk about God's thoughts towards us, to have a future, to have a hope, to, for good, not evil, it's sanctification. That that's the will of God. Sanctification is purification. That's the meaning of it, that we continue a life of purification, that we're renewed day by day, that we're renewed to the, to the image of Christ that Christ builds in us, that grows in us. That we get to the point where Paul was like, it's not, I don't live anymore, it's Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. I don't condemn you. I'm not condemning you. But go and sin no more. That's my will. My will is that you don't sin anymore. Now the reason Jesus loved this woman and the reason it turned out, this test, this temptation turned out so well, is we've got to see the comparison between another time they tested Jesus. You can turn with me, if you wish, to Mark chapter 12, verse 13. I'm just going to read another occasion where the Pharisees and the scribes tested Jesus. 
It said, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Here we go again. Entrapment. When they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. Now, just to clarify there, they're, they're partly correct in that. Jesus didn't show partiality. Like God does not show partiality or favoritism. It says that Christ came for all mankind, that no one should perish. But they said that you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men. And that is correct, because Jesus did what the Father told him to do. He did what the Father does. Jesus said, what I see the Father do, I do. You do not regard the person of men, but teach the way in God in truth. Here's the, here's the test, here's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, but Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it to him and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What did they do? They marveled. <laughs> they marveled because this is God. Now, Jesus looked at that coin, and the comparison I got this week when I was reading John chapter 8, God gave me this comparison because when Jesus was given that coin, it had Caesar's head on it. It was made and fashioned by Caesar, it was inscribed by Caesar, it had Caesar's face on it, it belonged to Caesar. And here we are, the scribes and the Pharisees in John chapter 8, bringing something that is fashioned by God, that has God's name on it, that has God's likeness on it, the adulteress. The adulteress belonged to God. Like all of us, we're fashioned by God. We belong to God. So Jesus took a very vested interest in this. He didn't just dismiss the woman and say, take her away from me, she's sinful. I'm not. Jesus wouldn't do that. He worked and loved and uh, he worked in compassion, in love. And he saw the adulteress as someone created in the likeness of God. And God wants so much for us to be in relationship with him. And it's the sin that separates us from God. See, Jesus didn't love the sin. Actually, you'll see verses in the word where the sin is hated. It can't be loved. It separates. God cannot have anything to do with sin. But Jesus loved the sinner. That's the difference. That's the difference. And in John 3.16, one of the, along with Jeremiah 29.11, would be probably the most well-known, famous verse that everybody knows. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But have we ever read John 3.17, John 3.18, John 3.19, John 3.21-22? Because it goes on from that. It said, For God did not send, from 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that, through, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth, he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. God's desire for all mankind is that we do not walk into the condemnation that comes with the penalty and punishment of sin. We are, I say it a lot in the sermons, 
but we all fall short of the glory of God. All of us do. That's why Jesus came. If there was one person that didn't sin, Jesus would not have any need to come. We would have gone, oh, there's a perfect example. But the only perfect example, sin-free, sinless, was Christ, Jesus Christ. And God couldn't give a greater gift to mankind. There is no greater gift. It couldn't have cost God any more than in his only begotten son. But whoever believes in him, she believed, Lord. And he said, okay, condemnation's passed over you. You know, I forgive you. Uh, Repent. Belief carries with it something. Because it's not enough to say, Yeah, I believe in God. I believe he exists. It's not enough. The biggest believer in God is Satan and his demons. And look what happened there. They believe in God more than anybody, more than anything. But our belief draws us to the cross in repentance. It draws us into relationship. It allows us to have forgiveness of sin. It allowed the adulteress to be forgiven of her act. Was she in sin? Absolutely. Who had the greater sin? Probably the Pharisees and the scribes. But she was in sin. But the Lord came to earth, died and rose again that we may have repentance and a remission of sin. For this reason I came to preach and teach and bring the good news. This is what Jesus said. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the simplicity of our walk. But once we repent and we enter into that and condemnation passes over us, he says, now sin no more. For this is the will of God, that you're sanctified, that you're purified, that you're kept holy, undefiled, like a bride waiting for a groom. Jesus didn't come to condemn. But we read in John chapter 3 here, those verses, Jesus didn't compromise either. Jesus said, love, I love, I love mankind. I love mankind in the world. I want to see you saved. I want to see you restored to the Father through relationship in me. I want to see you filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in water and spirit. I want to see you have life, pass from death to life. But you've got to believe. You've got to repent. You've got to ask me to help you with the sanctification, with the purification, with your walk. Because sin separates, you can't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remain in sin, it is extremely difficult. It separates. It puts up barriers and walls. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27... From verse 25 to 27, it says, and this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And he, he, really, he starts out at the beginning of this, this section with, you know, wives submit to your own. He's giving instruction, really, on how husbands and wives are to live and to treat each other in a godly way. He's talking about a godly marriage. And he says, husbands, love your wives But it goes on, it says, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we see here that Christ in John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him may have condemnation passed over them. Whoever believes, repent, belief, justification. Now we see here where Paul is saying, where God is saying, Christ loves the church. Now this is our sanctification and our purification in the walk. This is the church. He said that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That we might sanctify, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The word inspired by God for doctrine reproof, correction for righteousness, that God may be glorified, that he, Christ, 
might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That is the church that Christ is returning for. Without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, through what he did at the cross, that we may walk in his purification and sanctification with his help. Before I close, I'm going to read a couple of verses from Revelation. In Galilean culture, weddings are a big deal. And Christ refers to the church as a bride and him as the bridegroom. And in Galilean culture, the way people would get married is they would start off by being betrothed for marriage, much like our engagement today. People are engaged for X amount of time. We were engaged for about six months before we were married. Typically, in Galilean culture, it was about a year. You were betrothed to be married and the bride really was put away for a year. They actually would be separated and... After about a year, the way they used to get married was the father of the groom would make the decision when the wedding would take place. So the father might wake up one day after a year and say, today's the day, prepare the wedding feast, my son is marrying his bride. And then people would send message to the bride and say, get ready, today's the day. It was, it was really out of her control. And actually, if you look at it, it was out of the groom's control as well. And that's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, for no one knows the day or the hour that I will return, that the Messiah will return, the second coming. Not the angels, not the son, but only the father. This is a picture of end times. We are currently in the betrothal period waiting for Christ to return, waiting for the father of the groom to say, today is the day. Today I'm having a wedding. Today the wedding feast is being prepared. The the imagery here is not a coincidence. Jesus, a Galilean, used this to point to end times. It's a marriage. And in Revelation, it describes this in chapter 19, verse 7. It said, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready, the church. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This is the truth. This is the truth we hear this morning. That Jesus is coming back for a spotless bride. And he's looking for his church who have remained faithful, without spot, without blemish. Does this mean we get it correct? Absolutely not. We're humans. We're in the flesh. But our battle is not against, our battle is the spiritual. The flesh and blood we walk in, battle is in in the spiritual. Because we have a spiritual wedding feast that we are preparing for. And that comes through sanctification and purification. That means sin, cleansed of sin. Very simple. See, that adulteress had looked at Christ and gone, Lord, Simple faith, simple encounter. He didn't do anything amazing. He was just Jesus and it was love. It was love that brought her. He didn't even speak much. He just loved her. The unlovable. He loved the unlovable. That's where I really see the church out in the streets at times, loving the unlovable. I've got a heart to see people brought into the kingdom. You know, I I know we all have that. We all share that same heart. But that's Christ's heart. That's Jesus' heart. 
you know, we'll, we'll be accused of things because Satan is the accuser. But do you know what? When Satan accuses you, as a Christian, when we're struggling, when he accuses you of something, tell him to go away in Jesus' name and go, do you know what? Because you're accusing me, I know that I'm part of his church. I know that I'm brethren because he is called the accuser of the brethren. If you weren't brethren, he probably wouldn't be accusing you. Christ desires that no man perish, that we all have everlasting life, but that, is, that decision rests with us. We are fully informed. If you haven't received Christ today, receive him. You're fully informed. Receive Christ. It is the greatest thing that is, it is the coolest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. I was that adulteress. I was that person. I was in sin. And we can look at adultery, not just as the sin that we've seen here that the woman was caught in, but we look at it on a spiritual level. Spiritual adultery is any sin. It separates the bride from the bridegroom. In James 4, when it says that friendship in the, with the world is enmity with God, if you are friends with the world, if you take the world over God, you become an enemy of God. Strong words, but very true. But the beginning of that verse, James 4.4, 4, it starts out and it names, it says, adulterers and adulteresses. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. If you're friends with the world, you're an enemy with God. It's enmity with God. Spiritual adultery is walking into sin. And if you're an intentional sin today, if you're a Christian and you're residing in sin, take it to the Lord. He doesn't intend for us to walk in sin. That's why he went to the cross. The blood of the lamb. And it says it's, it's the, the marriage supper of the lamb. The lamb that went to the cross, he was the only one without spot and blemish, without wrinkle. And that's who he resided in. See, Paul knew that when he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? Ah, Christ will. Jesus will. Jesus saves. Jesus saves us from condemnation, but he doesn't compromise. It's purification, sanctification that we must walk in. That's not putting burdens on people. That's just the walk that Christ wants for us because he's coming back for a bride that is purified. Let's pray. Lord Father, I thank you for meeting. Lord, I thank you for meeting me in particular, Lord. I thank you for meeting your church, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for your grace, your mercy, Lord, that you would stoop down to mankind, Lord. You would stoop down to us, Lord, and with the finger of God, you would write on your, your perfect law of liberty on our hearts, Lord. Lord Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that, Lord, it's not through anything we can do, Lord, but it is through you and what you did at the cross. Lord, that without repentance, none of this would make sense. Without you, Lord Jesus Christ, we couldn't come to the Father. We couldn't have a remission of sin. Lord, we would carry condemnation and the punishment of sin, death and Hades. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the punishment that you took for us at the cross. I thank you, Lord, that you commuted death for that adulteress. Lord, that the punishment of death passed over her and onto you. Like all of us, Lord, mankind, the world, that whoever believes, Heavenly Father, we would pass from death to life. Holy Spirit, I pray you help your church, Lord, in these end times to purify itself, to sanctify itself, Lord. Give us the grace and mercy as you stoop down to us and you continue to write your perfect law of liberty on our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, I just glorify your name today, Lord. Lord, let none of this be about man, Lord, but be everything about you. Everything about Christ. Everything about you, Lord Father. Holy Spirit, do a mighty work with us. Build us, grow us, sanctify us, purify us. Keep calling us into that place with you, Heavenly Father. Lord, I give you all the glory, honour and praise this day, Lord. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, everybody. Uh, we'll see you uh, for the midweek. 
uh, message. Um, have a great rest of the week. Enjoy the weather this weekend. The sun's out. Uh, so it's time to go and spend some time in the rays, I'd say. Be blessed, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. And really, can I encourage you to seek the Lord with your hearts? You know, he said to seek me. Seek my face while it can still be found. Seek, seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be blessed.